Hi everybody, I'm Sean Swindler and this is the um, Kansas Lynn Family Education Series and tonight we're going to be talking about advocacy for the school aged child which is a huge topic and so we're just going to hit a lot of the high points and hopefully stimulate some questions and and, and point some folks in the right direction. Um, tonight I'm going to be presenting along with my colleagues Stephanie Coleman and Jennifer Palmer and we're each gonna take part of this. Um, I'm from the Kansas Center for Autism Research and Training as well as our Kansas LEND. And I'm also the parent of an 18 year old with autism and an intellectual disability. And so we're just gonna talk through some of the really complex pieces that go into this lifelong job you have if you're the parent of a child with, with a disability of, of advocacy. So what, some assumptions we start with um, and some principles we need to start with is we know that as the parent and caregiver, you know your child best. Um, and, and that's a principle you need to hold dear to you, that the person that knows your child best is you. Um, we also know that advocating for your child is hard. It's probably one of the hardest things you can do. We also know that advocacy, medical management, working on their child's service needs can sometimes feel like a part-time job. I know recently I had to respond to a concern from my child's school and I had to drop what I was doing um, at two o'clock in the afternoon, drive to my child's school, deal with that, come back, catch up on the work that I was missing out on. Um, it, it is a sometimes like a part-time job to keep up with all of the paperwork and all of the other chores. Um, we know advocacy in school is just the beginning. It's gonna be a lifelong process. One of the things that happens when your kiddo turns 18, there are certain milestones where you know your child is different than other kids. Um, at different times when you start seeing a divergence with your child and other ch children. One of the times is when they turn 18 and a lot of their peers and a lot of the friends who have kids who are the same age, their kids are going off to college, their kids are driving, their kids are being really independent and you are still engaged in this advocacy process. You're still making play dates for your kiddo. Your child doesn't drive, so you're still doing transportation. And, and it feels like this childhood piece is still ongoing. It just starts taking a different tack. Um, we also know advocacy is emotionally challenging and in that it's okay to be emotional at times. So, so when you're advocating for your child, there is really nothing more personal. There is nothing more important than what you're doing. And sometimes that's gonna be emotional and it's okay to display those emotions at certain times because it, that's the reality of what's going on. So some things that we wanna look at as we move forward with doing advocacy um, is one is to build your support network. Um, it's really important to not take this on alone. And, and sometimes, you know, I'm a person, I'm pretty famous for not delegating enough and wanting to do everything myself at work. And, and sometimes that happens in home and with advocacy too. And why do we do that? We do that because, well, if I want it done right, I'm gonna have to do it myself because it's so important what you're doing and advocating for your child. But realistically, you can't do it yourself. Even if you're a single parent, you can't do it yourself. You need a support network. You need a friend, you need a family member, you need a neighbor, you need somebody from church, you need other folks able to be a part of, of your child's advocacy. You need somebody to be with you if something's really hard to talk about. You need somebody to bounce ideas off of. You need somebody to tell you, you know, I think you're taking this too seriously. Or you need somebody to say, are you paying attention to what's going on here? This, you need to really take this seriously, what's going on. Um, so the other piece is, you know, you really want to learn all you can about your child's diagnosis, the services they have available, and their rights. That, that's a whole presentation in itself, <laughs> if we were to just take off on that. But, but knowledge is power. The whole point of our family education series is knowledge is power. And so knowing about your child's diagnosis and what the research says should happen, knowing what best practices are in working with your child, knowing um, what your rights are in the school system, and when, once they get older and some of the other systems that, that might help take care of them, 
Um, that's, pow that's really powerful. And one of the ways to tackle the emotions, we're most emotional a lot of times when we don't know what to do and we don't know the answers. But if we can find out the answers and we can bring information to the table, that gives us power and that helps us tackle that advocacy. And the other thing that's really important is to take care of yourself and assume you are always doing the best you can for your child. Um, what, what we mean by that is you are obviously doing everything you can for your child in every situation. You are in advocacy and making sure they get what they need, but school, school advocacy is hard, medical advocacy is hard, the systems that offer support are really hard and they're complex. Sometimes they're complex by design. Insurance and Medicaid and some things like that can be hard to navigate. You're doing okay. What you're doing is okay. And assume you're doing okay and tell yourself you're doing okay with, and, and tomorrow you're gonna wake up and try, try again because that's all you can do. I've, I've worked with a lot of parents for many, many years. And one of the things that happens is sometimes parents, including myself, be, we beat ourselves up. Um, because we feel like we didn't handle the situation right, we missed an opportunity, we didn't do handle this meeting the right way. But you know what? We're who we are, and we can only do what we can do, and learn and learn from that and move forward. So, one of the important things on where to start is to have that vision for your child's life, and. We all have a vision for our children, whether they have, a, they have a disability or not. You can picture any child and what you want them to experience as they go through school, what you want them to experience as they get their educa further education, what you want their career to be like, what you want their job to be, what you want them to have a relationship with somebody else, you want grandchildren someday. All of those are hopes and dreams that we have for our children and children with disabilities. The difference with a child with a disability is that disability is complex. That's why there's 15 people around the table at school helping support this child. It's complex. So you gotta write stuff down because it might be a little, look a little bit different for your child to achieve that vision that you have. And unless you write it down and unless you start deliberately thinking through, it, it's probably not gonna happen as automatically as it will for your child that doesn't have a disability. So. Um, and, and, and what that vision is, is deeply personal, and they're your own values and your family's values. And it's rooted in your tradition and in your family and in all these other influences that we have. Um, and, and so nobody can dictate that but you for your child. And, and that, so getting that on paper and knowing what your vision is for your child can be a really important guiding principle as you move forward and you start looking at what the educational system can offer, what different service systems can offer, um, what their social needs are, what their day-to-day -day support needs are. And when we take that input and look at our vision for our child, then we modify what that needs to look like as we move forward. We've all had that experience where you know, in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, we've looked at our child and looked at their peers and realized they're not in the same place their peers are, either academically or socially or both. And what we do with that information is we modify our vision. Um, my son from two years ago has on his IEP, he's gonna go through the driving handbook and he's going to pass that driving test. St still not there yet. And to be honest, I don't think he's ever gonna drive because I don't think he has the emotional regulation to be able to drive. And, and, and that's a modification to even what five years ago I thought. I thought maybe by age 20 he'd be driving. I don't know if he will. Um, so we modify, and okay, can we teach him to use Uber and Lyft? teach them to use the bus system. So when we think about that, what you're really writing down is this vision statement for your child. And what I have found really helpful is, you know, with yourself and with your family members and other loved ones and other friends, if you can put this vision statement together, it could be a single piece of paper. What do we want his life to look like now and in the near future and in the far future? If you can put that down and just bring that to you to meetings, that can kind of be a guiding principle. For example, 
Um, for some of our, I'm a believer that socialization is much more important than academics for kids. That you can buy, you can always learn things, but you can't buy academics, you can't buy a school full of typical age peers for your child to have models and friends and to learn from. Um, and so if that's really important to you and you know you, your child tends to be social and wants to have friends, then that's part of that vision that guides what you advocate for on a daily basis. You also, those, your child's educators, after, you know, once they get to know your child, um, they, almost everyone I've met has, cares about children and they want children to succeed. They, get, they spend six, seven hours a day with your child, so they get to know some things about your child that you don't. And so even though you're the expert, asking them for their input on this vision can be really helpful. They may see things that you don't see. One of the things when we talk to transition educators, people who work with kids as they graduate high school, inevitably what they say is that they have a higher expectation sometimes than most parents have for what their children can do, myself included. My child's educators have had to tell me that I should have a higher expectation for him um, than what I'm assuming he can do based on what goes on at home because they see a whole different side of him at school. And, and so take in what, what your child's educators can give input to. So we're also building an IEP. We actually had, have done a family education series on working on your IEP, and we'll do that in the future. Building an IEP is a whole other presentation, but I'm going to hit a couple. I was just going to say they can go back and see that. IEP. Yes, and, and just a reminder, we have on, on our Facebook page, we have past presentations, so you can see Leah Holly from Families Together talking about that IEP um, session that we did. But one of the things that you want to do is to build an IEP. You want to build a good relationship with your special education teacher, para, school administrators, and therapists. Assume they're doing the best they can with the information and resources they have. Um, an example is one of the things we have right now across all helping professions is a workforce crisis where most schools are short, sometimes 50%, the number of paras they need. Um, and, and so most special educators are going into their classrooms with half the amount of people they need, they need to help. And there's some advocacy we can do to make sure your child does get what they need listed on their IEP, but the reality is that, you know, we need to build that good relationship and assume people are doing the best they can with what they have. That doesn't mean we don't advocate when we think our child's really needs are not being met, and we'll get into that. Um, the other thing is to think about, you know, because they are professional educators, they may have different ideas about how to achieve the same goal that you have in mind. So you may have a goal in mind of whether it's socialization, whether it's reading, whether it's, it's, it's doing different things as part of a PE curriculum, and they may actually have some ideas that are different based on their experience, and it's worth listening to some of what some of their ideas are. So there's a whole piece in here I am skipping because it's too complex, which is, you know, before your child has an IEP, they have to be evaluated and determined eligible to receive an IEP. That's a whole process. We're going to assume your child is eligible for an IEP because that would take up, again, a lot, of, a lot of our presentation. But once it's time to develop that, once you've got that IEP, um, there's some things to do so that you can do your best to advocate and to make sure you stay on top of, of what needs to go in there. Um, the first thing is request in writing a proposed copy of the IEP prior to the meeting. And in writing these days means email. Email has the same force of law as sending a snail mail stamped letter. And it's even better, it's time, it's time stamped and dated, and, and, which is really awesome. Um, so request in writing. So that means that if you're having an IEP meeting on Friday, then see if Wednesday or Thursday they can email you a copy of what they're proposing. That, that's really important because, again, knowledge is power, and it lets you go through and make sure that the concerns that you have and some of the things that you need to see on the IEP are being done. Um, 
the other thing is as you approach, well, I don't necessarily know I like what they're doing in this particular area or we need to add something to the IEP. Um, doing some research and, and bringing in suggestions based on best practices and research and examples from, from, and the internet's wonderful, from other programs. You know, there are websites that teachers have where teach, like te Pinterest for teachers, where they put all sorts of ideas for doing interventions with children on. And, and you can find, find those, look for those ideas and bring those ideas to the meeting. Um, that's more effective than emotions. There are serious situations where people are gonna get emotional, but when we're talking about curriculum, we're talking about programming, bringing those ideas to the table is more effective than demanding or just feeling a strong emotion about something. You mentioned the website um, where they can go and look and get some ideas. How do they know that that's a credible site? Oh, that's a good question. So, so one of the things we one of the things we look at is you know whether something's credible, whether it's an evidence-based practice, and, and that's a really important piece. Is that there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, generally, when when it's being proposed by educators and people have those credentials, and we're talking about school programming, it's pretty easy to see these are some ideas to bring to the table. We don't have to do exactly this, but there's some ideas here that we can bring to the table. And the other thing is you do have rights under IDEA when your child does have an IEP, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So we talk about from advocacy to action. One of the challenges in advocating for your child when they have an IEP is that school is hard and sometimes things don't go right for your kiddo with an IEP, and then how do we, how do we talk to somebody about that when we know something's not right? We know things are going wrong for your child. My child's example, my child was being bullied at school in elementary school, and I knew he was being bullied. And when I brought the concerns to the teacher and to the administrator, they kind of dismissed it as, oh, kids are kids, are kids. what are you going to do? Which is not the right answer when a kid's being bullied, we know. Um, and, and so there's different things we can we can do to bring that attention, and so we'll kind of walk through some of those. First of all, um, typical school concerns. Um, access to related services. On your IEP, you have a number of minutes for speech, OT, PT, some of those other services that child receives. And if it feels like your child's not getting those minutes, or if it feels like those minutes are not very effectively used, that's something you may want to talk about. Not meeting IEP goals. I can't tell you the number of parents I've worked with who have like a middle school kiddo with ADHD and has an IEP with academic goals on it and they're failing every class. And it's not acceptable ever to have an IEP and to be failing every class. That is a sign that the school's not meeting that student's needs, not meeting their free appropriate public education. Um, they're not gaining academic skills. So they're stuck at a first grade reading level and it's fourth grade. Now that may be their reading level as they move forward because they have an intellectual disability, but it's really important to get some ver verification of that, to have other evaluations done to make sure we know wh where we're at and we're, we're gonna stop pursuing this academic goal. If it feels like your child might have more potential than what's being delivered, it's really important to look at that. Um, inclusion with same age peers, minutes in the general education classroom, this is a big one. Um, especially in elementary school. Um, we know inclusion is the most effective evidence-based practice for kids to gain socialization skills. And we know that kids being around same age peers is incredibly important. And a lot of times schools don't feel like they have the personnel to support inclusion in a gen ed classroom. It's really important to get that on the IEP and to, and to even have a goal for increasing the number of minutes in the gen ed classroom because that's a, that's a huge concern parents have, that your child, as they move through school, that experience in the gen ed classroom with their peers is gonna be one of the most important things they have, and their peers' experience with them as they get older in that same school is gonna be one of the most important things they have. Likewise, social skills. Um, sometimes schools are reluctant to put social skills on an IEP, 
And because they think it's hard to measure, it's not. There's evidence-based ways to measure whether a child's gaining social skills. That's often what a speech pathologist can work on with your child, is intervening in some of those social skill situations or doing some observation and trying to figure out better ways for your child to communicate with their peers. Um, I talked about bullying is a huge issue, especially for our kids with autism. Um, and a lot of times schools can sometimes be dismissive of bullying concerns, not all schools, but sometimes, and that's an important thing to bring, bring to attention. The other major concern we have sometimes is behavior. When we find out our child eloped from school, when we find out our child shoved a paraprofessional or was aggressive with another child, that's a concern for the school, that's a concern for us as parents, and that's probably of all of these things, the number one thing that we know, there are evidence-based ways to address behavior in school, and, and schools actually most of the time have those resources, but we need to bring those to bear if they're not come bringing, being brought to bear. Uh -huh. Bus behaviors can be included in the IEP too, right? Yes, exactly. The question was, can bus behaviors be included in the IEP? Yes, once the school has your child to take them to school, those behaviors on the bus, including having para support on the bus, are, are things you can ask for. Um, your child's behavior on a bus should not prevent them from being transported to school, especially really young kids. So when we talk about the role of the key players, it's frustrating, but it's really important with schools to follow the order of secession and, and, to, and to gradually escalate so that you can truly say to the next person you talk to, I already tried that. So the first person to talk to when you have a concern is just your child's special education teacher. You get a note that they hit another child on the playground, talking to them, what happened? How did this happen? What was the circumstance? All of those kind of things. Work, work those things out as a part of the typical um, parent-child teacher conference. Um, the supervisor of that teacher is the school administrator, is the principal. It's not the special education folks. That it's school administrator or principal is responsible for all the teachers who are in that school. And so if there's a problem or you're feeling like you're not being heard, just like a parent of a typical third grader who feels like their teacher's not hearing their concern, you would go to the principal or vice principal, depending on how big the school is, and talk with them about your concern principals are almost always willing to have you come to their office, sit down, and, and have that conversation. Um, after that, there is a special education administrator who's in charge of all the special education programming. If the special ed teacher and the school administrator can't work this out with you, um, sometimes going to that special education administrator next is helpful. One thing that sometimes is interesting is that that special education teacher may be really excited that you're taking your concern to their special ed administrator because they don't have enough Paris. They don't have enough support. They need something and, and they're really happy you as a parent are doing that advocacy. And they're gonna be your ally sometimes in doing that. Um, there's a special education director. Every special education system in every school district has a special education director who usually has a doctorate and, and is ultimately responsible for the goings on. I've worked with a lot of special education administrators and directors over the year when I, as an advocate for families, have called them and talked to them and said, this is what's going on. You can hear them visibly roll their eyes, sigh deeply, and, and they say, okay, and they take care of it because they aren't happy with what was going on and it was good for them to know that. You have the other situations where people circle their wagons and they're gonna stand together and, and, and we'll, we'll get into that. The other thing to remember is that there's a superintendent that's over all kids in all school districts. And there's a whole other process with that. You know, Just because your child has a disability doesn't mean at the base they're a child in that district, you're a taxpayer, and they need, your child needs to be well served by that district. So we talked about this a little bit, some stages of action. One is an informal parent-teacher conference. Um, that's just where I say, can I come in after school or before school and talk to you for 15 minutes about my concern? Um, a lot, most of the time, that, that often works to resolve a lot of concerns. You could call a formal team meeting, which is not an IEP meeting, just a team meeting with the relevant folks. Let's say there's a social skill thing going on 
and you might want to call in the special ed teacher and the speech pathologist who works with your child to try to address some of the social skill stuff going on in school and, and, and hash some things out and have that meeting just to because it's hard and everybody may need some good ideas to be generated to solve the problem. If you're frustrated, chances are your school folks that work with your kid are frustrated too, not because they're mad at your kid, but because this is really hard to deal with. Um, the other thing is you can always ask for an IEP meeting anytime as a parent. You can send an email to your child's special education teacher and school administrator and say, I've done an informal conference, I've done a team meeting, I don't think this is resolved, we really need to have a, a, a formal IEP meeting. The reason you have that is you have to either one, wanting to be changing the IEP goals, which is you're adding a goal, taking off a goal, or adjusting an IEP goal that you think is important to your child, you're talking about adding a behavior support plan or something else that's going to change the service delivery in the minutes that your child's receiving. Um, you are wanting to request a reevaluation re of your child to gather additional information. For example, we're stuck at first grade reading level, we're in fifth grade, and we really need to get some testing done to figure out what's going on because we think Thing, our child could, could learn to read at a higher level and we don't see progress being made. Um, or change to the placement. That could be um, there is a better placement in the district or within even the same school that your child needs to be a part of. That could include if your child's just excelling in gen ed, you may not think that they need to be spending as many minutes in that special education room segregated and so you may want them to be in gen ed more, that's a reason to request a new IEP meeting. So one of the really important things that sometimes happens for our kids with disabilities um, is that um, we assume special education and IDEA is the only tool we can use to make things better, but actually our kids are kids in the school just like anybody else. So there's a lot of other tools available to us to address concerns our ch children may have. Bullying, that's not just a problem for kids with special ed. If a kid was in special ed is being bullied, there's other kids being bullied in that school. There might be a school climate or culture issue that needs to be addressed. General physical accessibility. The American with Disabilities Act covers everybody and their accessibility. So when you, if your playground's not accessible, the bathroom's not accessible, things like that, if the elevator's broken in your child's school, um, then you, the ADA actually cover, covers that as completely separate from IDEA, although they still can't access their education if that's going on. District discipline policies that impact all kids. You've probably heard of school-wide positive behavioral supports. Um, sometimes school districts invest a lot into having school-wide discipline, positive discipline programs that actually work pretty well for all kids, including kids in special education. Um, sometimes some school districts have zero tolerance policies that are really harsh and really impact all kids, especially kids in special education. And even though there's discipline protections as a part of the IEP, which is a whole other presentation, um, those discipline policies could be addressed outside the special education arena. Um, safety concerns that impact all kids. Um, cars are driving too fast by the school. So, so my child who elopes and runs away and doesn't pay attention to traffic is certainly in the most danger, but all kids are in danger because that's going on. Other types of safety concerns that happen, that happens, even unsafe playground equipment affects all kids. Um, and then lack of staffing workforce issues. We acknowledge there's a workforce crisis, but that doesn't mean that our kids, especially with special education needs, are left behind. And even though not having appropriate staffing can impact the delivery of your child's services, um, sometimes the district needs to hear from groups of parents to know we need to change how we're approaching paying our support people better in school so we can get more people in here, those kind of things. The really important piece of that is that you can get with other parents, your parent-teacher organization, um, to help advocate um, and, and to address these issues that, again, that are outside of special education, but sometimes are more effective than simply changing your child's IEP. So real quick, um, remember, you don't have to sign the IEP at the IEP meeting. 
A lot of times, sometimes school districts pressure parents to sign the IEP right here and right now. I don't care if I have the perfect IEP, I don't sign the IEP until the next day because I want time to look at it, I want time to think about it, I want time for somebody else to look at it, I want time for my support network or a family member to help me look at it. Whatever re reason you have, you don't have to sign the IEP that day. Your child services will not be effective if you delay a day in signing the IEP. The other issue that happens sometimes is schools push the deadline for your annual IEP to the last minute and you end up, your deadline is October 29th and it's October 28th and you need to sign the IEP or this IEP is going to expire. Um, that's not your problem. Your child services remain the same until that new IEP is put in place and nothing happens. The only thing that happens is the school might get dinged because they have a late IEP. Again, that's not your problem. If they want to make sure that doesn't happen, they can start that process much sooner with you as a parent. Um, you can call an IEP meeting anytime. The other really important thing is to pick your battles. It's kids with, kids with disabilities, it's, things are complex, and there's a lot of stuff that comes up all the time. And it's really important to know I'm gonna let this one slide because I'm gonna lose this war, but I'm gonna lose this battle, but I'm gonna win the war later. Um, and so to pick your battles. Really and truly, you have so much, so, so many cards to put on the table, so many coins in your possession, and, and once you've kind of exhausted those, it's harder to get people to listen to you about your child. So what ends up happening is, there's a minor issue and I'm really gung-ho about it. I'm guilty of this, by the way, as a parent myself. There's a minor issue. It's like, we're gonna tackle this. And then two months later, it's a really big issue, but I already went house on that minor issue. And so, and, and you know, that's a learning process. I have a degree in special education and my child, and throughout his IEP process, he was probably in sixth grade before I kind of Learn, learn that, so. Are there any questions as we move on to the next section? So, so some things to think about. I told you that advocating for your child is like having a part-time job. It absolutely is. That includes Sometimes you have to develop a new set of skill sets or have people work with you who have another set of skill sets to help do things for you and to learn some things. So some things to think about as you do your advocacy. Um, one is always bring an agenda to the meeting. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be detailed. It can be three or four or five items, but bring an agenda that you're gonna pass out at the meeting. That doesn't mean that it's gonna be followed, but if you have that agenda, the things that you wanna make sure get talked about and everybody sees that, then you know that's on the table that I wanna talk about this. Also send the agenda the night before so they know what you wanna talk about. Um, talking points, don't pass this out, but the talking points are take that agenda and then write up what specific bullet points you wanna hit on each of those items. It can be very intimidating and emotional sitting in an IEP meeting, and you sometimes having that list of talking points can really help you stay focused and make sure you don't leave the meeting saying, I forgot to talk about that. So you have that, that bullet points in front of you. It's also helpful if you have somebody come with you to the IEP meeting. So if you have your friend or your neighbor or your spouse with you at the IEP meeting and you have that set of talking points, they can help keep you on track as you're trying to do advocacy, or they can take some of the talking points. One of the most effective techniques is if you're the main presence and the voice for your child in advocacy, bringing mom or dad in as that second voice and then having them tackle a couple issues, that, that can be a really effective to emphasize this is really important. And it also, if there's something that you're emotional about, that is really important to you and you have a hard time getting through, having that other person tackle that sometimes can be really helpful. So definitely bring your laptop or a notebook. You know, these days I bring my laptop to the meeting and I take notes on my laptop because my handwriting is horrible. <laughs> so take notes on that laptop. 
support, we talked about this, you can bring anybody you want to an IEP. Period. That is absolutely your right. You can bring anybody you want to that IEP meeting. Definitely you can bring that child's parent, other parent, but you can bring their grandma, you can bring their aunt or uncle, you can bring an older sibling, you can bring a neighbor, you can bring a friend from church, you can bring a pastor, you can bring anybody that knows your child well and can help support you during the meeting. Um, and it is a courtesy, I always let a school know if I'm bringing somebody other than the other parent. So if I'm gonna bring a friend or somebody like that, I'll certainly let them know that I'm bringing somebody in advance, but you can certainly always bring somebody else to the meeting. And if they want you to sign piece, that, per, that neighbor or friend or pastor to sign pieces of paper, waving FERPA or waving some rights so that they can hear information about your child, sure, I'll sign that piece of paper. Um, <coughs> supporting documents. So if your child has diagnostic testing, notes from their doctor, notes from a therapist, those kind of things, and you want to have that in front of you, certainly bring that to the meeting. You don't have to give all of that to the school just because you bring it to the meeting. Or if you have a notebook with all of their medical information, um, and the school says, school nurse says, hey, could I get a copy of that? You do not have to give it to them. You only give them what they need because you do control that information even if you bring it into the school building. Recording, in general, I don't think you should record IEP meetings. It intimidates everybody and it causes all sorts of issues. There are some schools that have policies against it. There are some schools that reluctantly allow it. Um, the state law on that is fuzzy. And so I say do a good job of taking notes, bring that extra person to the meeting to take really good notes as opposed to using a recording device. There are some rare situations where that may be contraindicated and you wanna do a recording, but that's a whole other, that's getting into some pretty deep stuff. In general, I don't record, I believe in recording IEP meetings, unless, again, it's something really egregious going on. Which goes to the next one, attorneys and legal assistants. Um, generally, you don't wanna bring an attorney to an IEP meeting unless you are ready to go to due process. And that's, again, a whole other level and a whole other, generally, it's not something I recommend unless there are health, safety, life and death issues going on for the child. Um, the reason is that the amount of time and the amount of emotional wear and tear that it puts on you as a parent is pretty significant. Um, but I, you need to note that if you bring anybody else but an attorney to the meeting, it is inappropriate for the school district to have their attorney at the meeting. So if you bring an advocate from an advocacy organization like Families Together to the meeting, the school district should not bring their attorney. And if they do, you can ask the attorney to leave the meeting because it, it is, it's only appropriate if you also bring an attorney. It's really not a fair fight to have the school district have their attorney in the room. So keeping track, these days it's so awesome. I used to 20 years ago when I talked to parents about this, talk about here's a sample notebook, <laughs> here's a sample file system, you can, he'll pass it around so you can look at it and here's some tabs you can all have to all learn how to keep track of all this. It is so cool because everything's electronic now where it should be. And so that's the most, the best thing that's ever happened. So make sure all IEP correspondence is, is electronic. If they send you a copy of the IEP, make sure they send you a PDF copy of your sign, the signed IEP after you turn it back into them. Yes, you can go and scan it in yourself and all that kind of stuff, which you certainly would do if you didn't have any other option. But it, make the school who has all that equipment handy send you that signed copy of the IEP or anything else you're, you're asking for from them so you have an electronic copy. Um, I definitely, you need to be you know, keeping it in one place, whether it's an extra, a hard drive or a USB, but it needs to be backed up in the cloud or somewhere else that's secure because I don't know how many people I've talked to who had a great set of child records and something happened and their computer crashed and they lost them all. So make these days backing things up in the cloud as securely is so easy that that's something you really need to consider doing if you have a child or put it on th 
grandma's computer and another USB somewhere else that's in a safe place. So the other really important thing is that an email, again, is a legal record. It's a legal written record. And so after you have any significant meeting or conversation with the school, if it's an informal, hey, how was your day? How do you do today? Oh, he did fine. He kind of was a little sniffly. And so, so we had to wipe his nose a couple times. Not that. But, but if, you're, if you have that meeting after school with the teacher, if you have that informal meeting, or certainly if you have an IEP meeting, you need to write an email, or if the school calls you and has a conversation with you, you need to write an email to them immediately afterwards saying, hi, it was great talking to you. I understand from our conversation that you said you were going to, and summarize what they said they were going to do, and that I am going to get you copies of such and such. Summarize what that conversation is and send that, that becomes a record of that conversation. Um, and, and the important part of that, number one, is it helps you. You may think, oh, I'm going to remember this, but you're busy and your child's going to do something next week you're going to remember too. Having that record is really important for you as a parent to have. Um, the other thing that it does is it shows the school that you're keeping track and that you are paying attention to what you're being told and that there is some accountability chain from you because you have a record of it. It's really important to demonstrate that, especially as things get more complex for your child. The other thing that I do sometimes is I'll send an email to myself um, and I'll say, and I'll, I'll just type out some thoughts that I have that, you know, I'm not going to send this to the school, but here's what I'm thinking needs to happen because it's a great memory jog. And again, it's a real time date stamped recording of what's going on here. So some other meeting tips. Um, your child should not know there is a disagreement between you and the school. So in other words, putting child first. Um, I've worked really hard. My child has autism and he doesn't like school sometimes. And he looks for excuses not to comply with everybody, including with the school. And if he knew that I was really not happy with what the school was doing with him, he would take that and triangulate that in his behavior and he would, that would egg his behavior on. It is really important that I don't, there's egregious things that are separate, restraint, seclusion and things we got to, that's a separate thing. But in general, um, when, it's, when, when somebody takes 18 points away from your kid and they probably shouldn't have done it, um, you say, well, you shouldn't have done that. You lost the 18 points. And then you deal on the back end with making sure that doesn't happen again. It's really important that your child doesn't see again and less egregious harmful stuff is happening that, that you're separate from the school in terms of discipline. Because um, so many kids, especially kids with autism and mental health concerns, um, can take that and triangulate. Also, um, nothing devalues trust between a parent and a school team than feeling like the child is using the, some of the things they're hearing at home about advocacy against the school. Um, kids who are saying, my mom thinks you're a horrible teacher, <laughs> which I've heard kids say. Um, so, so the other part about that, not only should you not show that disrupt, dis disagreement with the school, it's really important and really hard when you have a kid that's underfoot all the time, especially like a teenager that's always listening, um, to make sure that you're doing things confidentially and, and not where your child is able to triangulate and understand some of that. Um, as kids get older and kids are 17, 18, and they're a part of the IEP process, which they should be as self-advocates, there are still behavioral issues sometimes. And, and it can be impossible to address behavioral issues when that person is sitting right there because you're trying to create a, a visual schedule and a reward strategy and things like that. It's okay for them not to be in that entire meeting so that you can concentrate on some of that behavioral modification and some of those kind of things you know, before they're 18. The other thing is never walk out of a meeting. I strongly believe never use walking out of a meeting as a tactic. It takes away all of your power because all of those people are sitting around the table and you're not. And they can talk about your child as long as they want to. 
So never walk out of a meeting. It's okay to cordially end a meeting to say, you know, this isn't what I expected. I th don't agree with much, most of what's here. So I think I need to reformulate my thinking and we need to come back together a different time. And so I'd like, I'd like us to disperse and we'll end a meeting. But, but just walking out of a meeting out of anger or emotion is usually counterproductive. Um, and, and so just, and there are times when you may want to do that, but that's something I don't believe to do. The other thing that's really, really important is to avoid making things personal. 99% of special education teachers and school personnel are doing the best they can and care about your kids. And sometimes your kids are really hard and they do things that are really frustrating. And you know that because you're their parent. Um, and you don't want to say things like, you don't know how to teach my child. You're the worst teacher my child's ever had. You don't know how to handle behavior. Um, you must hate me or you must hate my child. Making things personal puts up a wall, makes things very difficult to address for the school team. And it, you know, you're, these are the folks that are with your child six or seven hours a day. You want them on your side and your child's side. So it's really important to, to avoid some of that per getting personal about some of those kinds of things. There are rare instances where there might be discrimination or there might be retaliation or there might be things going on like that. There's a whole section of IDEA law that covers that and there's a very certain way to handle that. Um, but again, that's separate from just kind of some of those feelings that might be generated. So I'm going to have my, oh, go ahead. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so if I'm a parent that has disabilities, mm -hmm. what kind of accommodations does the school have to provide any accommodations? That's a great question. If I'm a parent with a disability, um, does the school have to accommodate me? Absolutely. So that includes if, I'm, if I need an, a sign language interpreter, if I need things in Braille, if I, need, if I speak Spanish. The school has to have that interpreter and, and preferably materials prepared in Spanish for me. Um, if I speak a different language, that school needs to accommodate that. So across the board, all disabilities and certainly the meeting space and where you're going needs to be accessible. I'm going to bring my colleague Jennifer Palmer here to talk about some other special considerations. with my hands so I don't want to knock it off. Is that okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. My name is Jennifer Palmer. I'm a registered nurse. I am a pediatric case manager and <clears throat> I'm a current LIN trainee. I have been working with um, advocacy for about seven or eight years and I have a daughter that's nine that has an intellectual disability and I'm a single parent so <laughs> I get the, the privilege of talking to you guys about this. Um, I've recently, my own self, we had, to go, we had some custody disagreements and a lot of it was based around my daughter and what the perception of her needs was. So <clears throat> as I nav navigated everything, one of the things is to, it's not on the slide, but Make sure that you don't talk bad about the other parent in front of the school people, and that can be sometimes a challenge. But make sure whatever custody orders and parental schedules that you have already in place, make sure that those are in the school, that your teachers know, that the principals know, and if you are changing the kids at two different places on different days, that the bus schedule's all lined out so you know where your kid's body is all the time, because that can be very stressful for you and for the child. And um, I use a lot of text for um, my daughter. Uh, my daughter's nonverbal, so communication's really important with the school. Even just, did she eat lunch? Did she, was she crabby? Did, you know, we did this at school. She did well here. She didn't do so great here. So I can kind of support what we're doing with her and give her um, home support that is correlating with what the schools are trying to do. So um, we use a notebook that goes in her backpack so when she's with me, I write in it every night, like how much sleep she has, because sleep really impacts her behaviors and anything like that. Um, and then when she's at her dad's house, he writes in it. So that way there's a long log. And um, we ended up having to use that, that school stuff when we actually ended up in court that that was all submitted as evidence. 
Um, some people use an app. There's a Talking Parents app and some other things like that. <clears throat> um, if you have jo joint custody with the uh, child's other parent, um, that automatically means the school has to give the same weight to the request for both of them. So even if you don't disagree, try to get on the same page at least and talk through some of the issues um, before you go into the IEP because you can't really get any traction if you're fighting with your ex and then you're not presenting a united request to the school. So then you, nobody wins, and really the, your child doesn't get very far ahead that way. Um, however, even if you are, have joint custody and everything is fine, I have found that the schools seem to defer to the most engaged parent. So if you're the parent that they see at the Halloween parties, if you're the parent they see at the conferences and volunteering for field trips and all of that, almost always when there's a problem and you go in, and it's it's funny because they'll look at both of you and then they'll when they have an issue they talk to you so and that's kind of just what it is but that's also very helpful if you're the primary caregiver um, so be very visible with your um, school functions and try to support the classroom as the best you can if you're um, in a custody battle or having a disagreement okay if there are disagreements with the school or co-parent, the child should not be in the middle. That's, we talked about that earlier. Um, again, try to not talk about it in an angry voice when they're around because they, even if they're um, not terribly cognizant of the underlying issue, they will pick up on that emotional. Um, bring a support person to the IEPs or if you tend to get overly emotional when dealing with stuff like that. Um, address issues, issues in a personal manner and try to frame your issues um, firmly but respectfully saying, you know, I really feel like we need to work on more inclusion time, so th we'll do a half a day now, but probably by the middle of the year, I'm gonna wanna move to an additional hour or whatever your requests are. Always focus on the needs of the child. And that can be a challenge sometimes because this, it just is, trying to figure out how to maneuver because you're so focused on what you're doing with your child and then your ex is over here doing something different. <laughs> and he's, you know, my case, he was like, oh yeah, that's fine. And I'm like, no, it's really not. So we're gonna go back to that. And that's okay. We worked out all the way through and I ended up getting almost everything I asked for. And eventually over the years, he's kind of just gotten on the board because honestly, because I do the most research for her IVPs. And so when I go in, I usually have evidence-based stuff with me on to why I feel like it needs to be added. And even though the school's not always thrilled about it, they usually give it to me because it's just easier for them. So medical advocacy is another big part of our kids' lives. And one of the things I talk to my parents about all the time is you have to find a pediatrician that aligns with your values and your family's values for your child's future. Um, and so I've had the very good luck that my pediatrician immediately assumes competence encourages her to go to soccer and ballet and dance and all these things that we have in the community. And they always assume that Emily is ready to do more. Um, so the statement, if you want your child to live and work in the community, but your doctor thinks that people with disabilities should live in an institution and they have that mindset, then they likely will not treat or support your child's needs to the extent that you feel like they should. That, and as they get older, that can deal with other things as far as medication, if you're more of a diet and exercise based family and you're with a doctor that just wants to continue to keep upping meds, you're gonna have that disconnect. So I would encourage you to do your research, ask around, read reviews, and interview your physician before you go with that doctor. Cause that's your right, is to have an appropriate medical support. Um, become an expert on your child's diagnosis, current treatments and medications. Oftentimes, parents catch that stuff is interacting incorrectly before the medical people do. So if you walk in and say, you know, this isn't working and they're not sleeping or they've had changes and whatever, if you can back it up with some kind of like specific, like the sleep patterns is a big thing for our, in our house. And it was like, if, you know, if we give her this, then she's, not, she's only sleeping till two and then she's up <laughs> for the rest of the day. So we really try to give them very specific things when you go to the doctor's office and you'll be much like, more likely to get the things that you need. 
join a local or national support group. Kansas City has several that are really, really good because that will give you information on what the other families are doing and how they're managing. Most of the time they're, they're dealing with the same problems that you are. And so that can be therapists, um, support staff, even places that are um, disability friendly like restaurants and theaters and those kinds of things that you can do as a family. Learn about clinical trials and studies that could impact their health. Um, I work with a couple of families and as soon as they see it on the news, I get an email. Hey, is this covered? Can we get this done? And as soon as, as soon as they come out of clinical trial and the medications are on the market and available and approved through the FDA, then we can get those, them started on that. But likely their local doctors wouldn't have caught it as quickly. Stay organized. So this is a big one and it's hard because <laughs> we're all working and parenting and chasing our kids and doing everything else. But if, if you're organized, it'll save you money. It'll give you better continuity of care, and it will keep your sanity in check. Everybody gets those things from the insurance company, the EOBs, and then this is denied, and you're chasing refills and all of that stuff. So find a system that works for you and try to keep it all in one place. Um, that way you can save yourself some money and your sanity. So is this one mine? Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Coleman. I'm the Family Support Coordinator at the Center for Child Health and Development at KU. Also, um, the Family Discipline Supervisor for the LEND program that puts on and sponsors these Family Education Series. So I appreciate you all being here in person and online. So thank you. Um, parent advocacy is definitely a lifelong process. Right now, I'm in my 25th year. I have a 24-year-old son on the autism spectrum that I've been advocating his whole life. Um, I can say he's away at college right now, so that's a great thing. Um, and I can't imagine that it's going to stop anytime soon. I'm in the future planning mindset right now for myself. And as I do that, I have to think about his stages and where is that going to go, no matter what age he is. Until he's, he and I are both no longer on this earth, I'll be trying to figure out how to advocate for all of that. Um, find your tribe, create your tribe. Uh, to me, that is a huge support network. A lot of people ask me, well, where do we find? How do I find others that understand exactly what I'm going through and can help me and whatnot? And sometimes, especially if you live in rural Kansas and you're a small town, you find one person that really gets you and you invite them to coffee. And then talk, spend time together, and then maybe the next week, you each invite somebody else. Even if only one person comes, that's still three of you, and you're continuously building your tribe. And while you're building your tribe, talk to your tribe, talk to them about, you know, sometimes it could be an embarrassing situation at home that something your child does, but don't be embarrassed about that. Feel free to talk about it, because I can promise you there's somebody out there that's having that same situation as you are right now. Um, definitely don't let other people's opinions guilt you into action. Um, uh, people are not always going to agree with your choices. Those are your choices. Those are your opinions. You have every right to have those choices and opinions. Uh, declining services, events, or associations that don't support your personal mission and vision. I do that. There's people out there that don't... Uh, believe the same things um, in autism that I do, that's okay. Difference of opinions. I don't know if anybody watches um, Ellen or follows Ellen DeGeneres or football this week. No? <laughs> okay, that's okay. Um, so Ellen, do you know who Ellen DeGeneres is? Okay, well she was caught in a picture with um, George Bush at the Dallas uh, Green Bay game. And a lot of people were going, how dare you, you know, how can you sit with somebody who doesn't believe the same way as you? It's okay that they don't believe the same way. 
all she talks about is being kind to others. So it's okay to, like, you can decline services, but still be nice about it. You don't have to say anything um, negative or derogatory about the services, the events, or the associations. I wouldn't suggest um, if you decline those services, then go out on Facebook or social media and say derogatory things about them. Um, Self-care and respite. It is so important to take care of yourself. I know Sean has mentioned it earlier this evening. Jennifer can clearly tell you um, how important it is for self-care and getting that, those breaks. Um, getting out there and taking walks, um, meditating, reading a good book, you know, taking a hot shower sometimes. Those are great ideas. Just, just standing there and letting the water run down on you for a couple of hours. Uh, local support groups, we talked about that. Um, there are many support groups here in the Kansas City area. Autism Society has a few. Uh, there's one on Facebook called Kansas City Autism Spot. Um, in the rural areas, unfortunately, I apologize, I don't have a lot of those. Um, I know families together could probably uh, talk about or let you know about some in their areas. But again, grow them naturally. Invite somebody to coffee invite somebody to lunch, then the next week invite somebody else. Each of you invite somebody else. Um, online forums, caution, yeah. Not everyone has a child with a disability and has the same goals, beliefs, or perceptions as you do. Smile, but don't let the negativity impact your child's needs. Again, it's not just somebody who doesn't have a disability or a child with disability, it's somebody who does have a child with a disability, but their perceptions in life are totally different than yours, and that's okay. Just don't let that negativity get you down. Um, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about transition um, because there will be a point that you all get to transition in your life. Um, so there's access to other services. When your child turns 18, they become an adult, they can, um, apply for supplemental security income and sometimes depending it's uh, under the age of 18 you are still have the opportunity to apply for that for your child however it will be based on your income and assets um, so if you have more than two thousand dollars in the bank or make a certain amount of money you're probably your child's probably not going to qualify while he's under 18 he or she is under 18 but as of 18 it qualifies on their income um, Medicaid, again, the same thing, uh, except for Medicaid, it's not always about income. Sometimes it's about the disability and the medical service needs. Commercial insurance, that's your employer-based, or you can get um, the marketplace to get insurance. Um, and if you do work with the case manager on any of these things, write down your questions so that you can remember, just like Sean said, walk into those IEP meetings with a set of talking points or agendas. It's the same thing with a case manager. Whenever you're going and applying for any of these, write down your questions ahead of time because I can promise you I've done it. You walk out of a meeting and you're like, oh, I forgot to ask that question. I do that every single day. Um, transition. So for most of us, especially uh, with kiddos on autism, a lot of times uh, home and community-based service waivers, uh, specifically the intellectual and developmental disability waiver in the state of Kansas. Uh, a child can get on that waiver at the age of five and it will follow them the rest of their life as long as they qualify for that service. Uh, they will receive a basis, re, re, what do you call it? I can't think of the word, re-eval. Um, for a basis every single year for the uh, IDD waiver. But those uh, things that they would include are targeted case management. So you'd have someone who is on your child's side and has their best interest, helping you navigate the service and support systems in the state of Kansas. It also helps with respite for you in home care. Um, once the child turns uh, 18, it could provide residential services, day service, um, day services. It can uh, provide financial, and there's a lot of other little things that it takes care of too. We already talked about SSI. Um, 
they can also work on SSI. If your child is 18, has SSI, you can still work. It changes the amount that they'll receive, but they can still work. And it's, an, it's completely figured out, but it's a whole nother um, story. Vocational rehabilitation. There's two parts to vocational rehabilitation now. There is something that's called pre-ETS in the state of Kansas that starts at the age of 14. So that's pre-employment transition services. And that they can go into the school and help starting with the discovery process and job skill process and getting those, those things starting to get them in place. And then once they graduate from high school, they can apply for voc rehab and voc rehab can do uh, job coaching. They help them get employment, meaningful employment. Uh, they can get a job coach. They can provide educational training. That could be um, college. It could be career vocational, like if they wanted to do a trade, any of those types of things. And then there's post-secondary options. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a question? Sure. When should we apply for the DDS waiver? The IDD waiver? The question was, when should they apply for the IDD waiver? Immediately. I will tell you, unfortunately, in the state of Kansas, it is an 8 to 10 year wait list. Um, during that time, if your child qualifies for Medicaid or is already on Medicaid, they'll get a targeted case manager. But if they're on uh, your private insurance, you have the opportunity to get a targeted case manager, but you would have to pay for that. But it is an eight to 10 year wait list. I tell people to get on that wait list as soon as possible. If your child comes to the top of that wait list and doesn't need the services, that's great. You can turn them down. But in 10 years, if your child, let's say your child's 10 years old right now, and in 10 years you go, oh my gosh, they're 20 years old, what am I gonna do now? And you get on that wait list, they're 20 years old, or 30 years old by that time. So get on as, as soon as possible um, and follow up. I will also tell you, um, make sure if you are on the wait list for that eight to 10 years, and say you move to a different county or different part of the state, definitely let them know your new address because they will send letters and if you do not reply to those letters when you come to the top of the list, they will say, figure out that you just aren't interested in the services, take your child off that list. You go and call and go, hey, where is little Johnny on the wait list? And they say, well, he's not on the wait list and you're starting all over again from scratch. So you don't want that to happen. Post-secondary options. There's a couple of different options for post-secondary. Like I said, there was vocational. Um, there are new uh, certificate programs, two-year programs at colleges, a lot of colleges. KU has one. It's called KUTPE. There is information on the flyer. Um, for those of you online, we can get you that link as well. Um, but it's a two-year certificate program having the college experiences, um, taking classes, learning job skills, and getting out and having that certificate and going on. There are four-year programs as well. My son is actually at a college in Arkansas right now that is um, providing supports and services for him to get a bachelor's degree in communications. So there are those as well. Um, list of resources. Here are some of, you know, um, I will tell you, as a family support coordinator, I get a lot of calls. I'm not an expert in everything. The great thing about me is I know a lot of people who are experts in what they do. Uh, families Together being one of them. They're the Parent Training Information Center in the state of Kansas. They have offices in Topeka, Wichita, and Garden City, but they cover the whole state, so it doesn't matter where you are. They have opportunities as IEP mentoring program. Sean had kind of mentioned that they would come and go to the IEP meetings with you. But they can also, if you just have a quick question, they have some experts in their offices that can really talk you through and say, yes, that is a reasonable ask of the school. Um, they also have healthcare um, professionals there too that can help you with some healthcare questions. They do some 
Uh, they have a couple of different, they do education advocacy across the state. So basically what that does is tell you, teaches you a little bit more about what your rights are as um, a parent for the IEPs. They do a FEET training, which is um, Family Employment Awareness Training, which is an amazing two-day kind of um, gets into really deep into the voc rehab, the post-secondary, some of those opportunities that we just don't have time to get into. Um, LEND, that's us. Sean is also a faculty member of LEND. Uh, Jen uh, Jennifer is the family LEND trainee this year. And our, our guest Mallory here has been a past LEND trainee as well and um, works with us there. The Down Syndrome Guild. They are amazing at gathering up and being together as a tight-knit group for the Down Syndrome community in this, um, the Kansas City metro area. And then the Autism Society of the Heartland, I kind of mentioned them. They have an office here, upstairs, and they also have, um, there's game nights, they do parent information nights, they do community activities, like they work with AMC theaters to make sure that they're sensory, sensory friendlies, um, I know they've worked with Splash Cove in the past, so they do s several of those. Um, what questions? Kind of ran through some things really quick. Any questions? Okay. I will tell you then, um, it is only 7.15, but we can wrap up early and um, but I did want to let you know, next month, November 14th, our family education series is on parent self-care. Uh, Marianne Hammond from Children's Mercy is coming to present that. And I forgot the title. It's on that paper right there. You can grab that for me. Oh. The title is Put On Your Mask First, It's a Long Flight. So if you've all um, ever flown, you know exactly what that means. Put your oxygen mask on first, then your child. Um, but she will be here on November 14th, um, 6 p.m. I think we're in the same room. Um, but if you have any questions, you can email Sean at sswindler at ku.edu or myself at scoleman3 at kumc.edu. And... Mm -hmm. So, thank you all for joining us tonight. Now, I think you have to do it on my phone. Hit end.